Hello and welcome everybody. In this video I will explain how the normal equations can be used to compute the least squares estimate in multiple linear regression. Let's jump straight in. So what do we need to do? The basis for all of that is again the matrix vector notation we introduced. So let us have first have a look at that. So our original equations that was a set of n individual equations where yi equals the intercept beta 0 plus x i1 beta 1 and so on plus x i p beta p plus the error epsilon p and that's n equations so i ranges from 1 to n, it's one equation for each observation. The idea of the matrix vector notation is to write that as one equation of a vector of size n. That will then look like this, y equals x beta plus epsilon. And to make this true, we need to set y equal to the vector of all left-hand sides, y1, y2, up to yn. And let's do the easy terms first. Epsilon similarly needs to be equal to the vector of all errors. So epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and so on, up to epsilon n. And the x beta, that needs to incorporate all of this. And there are these products, which will turn into the products from the matrix vector product here. And to make that all work out, what we need to do is we need to set x equals to the matrix which has ones in the first column and then the data in the remaining column so there is x11 one, one here and that is everything corresponding to observation one so that's up to x1p the second row corresponds to the second observation so that's x21 up to x2p and finally the last row is the nth observation so that's xn1 up to xn P. Good. Let me just write the indices, maybe in red. The columns, they correspond to beta 0, 1, and so on, up to p. So there are p plus 1 columns in total. And the rows correspond to the observation. So the rows I would number 1, 2, and so on, up to n. And this matrix, which is an n by p plus 1 matrix, p plus 1 because there is a 0 here, that can be multiplied to vectors of lengths p plus 1. This must, must match this dimension, so that is all good because beta has just the right dimensions and if we multiply it, let me write that, so beta will define as beta 0, beta 1 to beta p. If we define it like that, then the matrix vector product combines the rows here with this column and let's say the first row would be 1 times beta 0 plus x11 times beta 1 and so on up to x1p beta p. And if we compare that here, well, first x11 beta 1 and x1p beta p, these are directly here. And the column of 1, so that's a bit of a trick. 1 times beta 0 gives you beta 0 we need here. So we need to again imagine there is a 1 added here. Good, so that's the notation we are going to use. Now, the least squares estimate is the one which minimizes the residual sum of squares. And let me just write that again. The residual sum of squares, which I want to call r beta, that depends on the coefficients beta. And it's the difference between the observed values y and the predicted values from the model, these values. So the errors are not part of what's predicted. The prediction of the model later will just be that. The errors on top of this and gives us our observation. And the residuals are the difference between the observation and the predicted value. So they are the epsilons. So we have this minus the predicted value. Let's just write it out once more. Beta 0 plus beta 1 x i 1 plus beta p xip and then so these are the residuals that equals epsilon i and we want the residuals squared so we square the whole thing and then sum it up from 1 to n over all observations and that is a measure to how close the observations 
characteristic predictions and we use this to choose the coefficients beta 1, beta 0, beta 1 and so on up to beta p. Namely we choose them so that these differences are as small as possible and the specific way which turns out is convenient to combine these n errors is we square them all and sum them up. This way a positive error for one observation cannot cancel a negative error for another observation because after the squaring they are all positive. So if that number is small it means all errors are small. Good. And least squares regression minimizes that quantity. We want to minimize r beta by finding beta. Now I said we are going to use vector notation. So r beta is some i from 1 to n, epsilon i squared. And now we use a bit of notational tricks from linear algebra so that I can write as epsilon transpose times epsilon. And I want to just explain why that notation makes sense. So if we write for two vectors u transpose v, then the idea of this transpose sign here is that we normally consider vectors to be columns and with the transpose that turns into a row. So if I visualize this then I would have u1 up to un say. And v I have not transposed so that stays a column so I have v1 up to vn. And now we can consider that to be a matrix product of a 1 by n matrix and an n by 1 matrix. So we know the rule, it is go along this row, go along this column and we multiply u1 to v1 and u2 to v2 and so on up to un to vn and add them all up. So that would be some i from 1 to n ui vi. And what we just did was put in the same vector for both u and v. So we have epsilon transpose epsilon is same rule sum i from 1 to n epsilon i times epsilon i and that's sum i from 1 to n epsilon i squared. That's what we needed, sum of epsilon i squared. So that's just a notational trick here. Nothing new has happened. That symbol here is just shorthand for this. And I should just interrupt myself for a second to mention this. I have added an appendix to the notes which summarizes some results from linear algebra and it also summarizes a bit this notation. So if you are at all unsure about this kind of thing or the bit more ambitious linear algebra we are going to use later, have a look at appendix A and there I summarize very tersely but still hopefully understandably all the linear algebra we are going to use and I'll grow that over time. Okay, let's erase this page and go on. So we have now written the residual is epsilon transpose epsilon. And using what we did on the previous page, that equation we can solve easily for epsilon. Let me just do that. So epsilon is y minus x beta. Just bring x beta on the other side. So what we have here is y minus x beta transpose and then y minus x beta not transposed. Good, let's continue this on the next page. That's what we found. Now we can expand the brackets and because we are still at the beginning of the module I want to do that a bit slowly. I expect most of you will be fluent in that. So first the transpose we can take inside so we can go y transpose minus x beta transpose y minus x beta. Then comes the only slightly non-obvious bit. If we take this product x times beta apart with the transpose a swap order, so that y transpose minus beta transpose x transpose y minus x beta. And for these matrix operations the order is important so we cannot swap them back. That would change the value or in this case probably would make no sense because the dimensions don't match. So that's what we have. And then expanding brackets goes as usual. So we have y transpose y minus beta transpose x transpose y. That's everything to go with y. And then we have minus y transpose x beta plus beta transpose x transpose x beta. Let me just to avoid confusion write the dimensions. So y is a vector of size n. So I can just write an n here 
and the one here to just indicate y is n by one. And I do it this way to write the sizes in the gaps because y transpose is then one times n. And I can write one here and I don't need to duplicate the n. If I multiply matrices or vectors, the middle dimensions always need to match. So there will be no cases where I need to write two numbers here. So following the same logic, beta is a factor of length p plus one. So it's p plus one times one, but I transpose it. So it's one times p plus one. Then x is n times p plus one, but it's transposed. So it's p plus one times n and y is n times one. Good. Same thing here. Y transpose is one times n, x is n times p plus one and beta is p plus one times one. And here one p plus one n p plus one one. That's just a sanity check that we see we can multiply all of these things together. But that also tells us in total that thing is a one by one matrix. And that's a one by one matrix, and that's a one by one matrix, and that's a one by one matrix. So the whole thing, we can use that actually from the start, that's just a number. So that's number minus number minus number minus number. So first thing I want to do is use this fact. So since y transpose x beta, that's the third term, is a number. It's written as a one by one matrix here, but that just means number. So I can transpose this one by one matrix, nothing happens. So we have y transpose x beta is y transpose x beta transpose. And now again, this rule, if I transpose a matrix product, I have to reverse the order. So that will be beta transpose x transpose y transpose transposed again. If I transpose it twice, I get y back. So that's beta transpose x transpose y. And if you look, we have this term twice, that thing and that thing is the same. So really this term and that term is the same. So what we can write here is R beta is y transpose y minus two beta transpose x transpose y plus beta transpose x transpose x beta. Good. So now we want to minimize that thing. There are a few tricks, but here I want to do it without any tricks. We just do it like we do in analysis. So we take derivatives, set them equal to zero, and we now at the minimum, these equations need to be satisfied. So to find the minimum of R, we set all derivatives equal to zero. So D over D beta J. R beta. And with this exclamation mark, I just mean that is not a thing we know is true, but that's the condition we impose. And then we see whether we can find a beta to make it true, something we want rather than something we have. That's d over d beta j y transpose y minus two d over d beta j beta transpose x transpose y plus d over d j d beta j beta transpose x transpose x beta. That's j plus one, no, p plus one equations with p plus one unknowns because we want that for j from zero up to p. And beta has p plus one components also ranging from zero to p. Good, so there's a chance we get a system of equation which has exactly one solution. Great, then the first step is, the first term, there is no beta in this term. So the derivative will be zero. Y transpose Y just does not depend on beta. If we take the derivative, it equals zero. We just need to worry about this term, which has one beta and this term, which has two betas. Let's do them one by one. Okay, first one, D, D beta J, beta transpose X transpose Y. So that's some um, I from zero to P, beta I and the other product I don't need to expand, X transpose Y, also the I's component. And that is now rather straightforward. We need to compute this partial derivative, which means we are changing beta j. We are keeping all other betas fixed. So that is d d beta j beta j x transpose y j's component. And 
that is again straightforward. Beta j is a variable with a slightly complicated name, but still it's just a variable which is multiplied with a number. Here we have to answer what is the derivative of x transpose y j's component times beta j with respect to beta j. The answer is just the number, so x transpose y j's component. Good, that was easy. Now the next term is beta transpose x transpose x beta. So we have d over d beta j, beta transpose, x transpose, x beta. And here we need to be a bit more careful because there are two betas. In particular, I need to expand this product and that one. So that's d over d beta j, some beta i, x transpose, x i k, beta k. And as before, all the terms which do not have beta j n, we can throw out because they are constant for the purpose of this partial derivative. But now we need to be careful because either one or two of these could be beta j. So let's write that out. So we have d over d beta j. And then maybe the first one is equal to beta j. So we have beta j, x transpose x, now i equals j, so I write j k beta k, and let's here assume the second one is different. So that's for all k which are different from j. That is all terms in here where only the first beta equals beta j, and the other one does not equal beta j. Good. Then similarly, there is the term where only the second one equals beta j. And finally, there's the possibility that both betas equal beta j. So that would be beta j x transpose x rho j column j beta j. Good. So that's all the terms in here which have a beta j in. Now, the derivatives. The first one, same logic as we had, will just, well, the derivative is beta j is just the number. So we get some k not equal to j, x transpose x j k beta k. Then the second term, same logic, only the beta j is at the end. We get some i not equal to j, beta i x transpose x i j. I'm taking the derivative with respect to beta j, so I'm left with the number in front. And the third one is slightly more interesting, namely that has now beta j squared. So the derivative, well, first is the preta factor, but then it gets two beta j. So we get two x transpose x j j beta j. Good, and now we can plug that all back together. This matrix x transpose x is symmetric. If you transpose it, nothing happens. And that means x transpose x i j is the same as x transpose x j i. So let me modify that a bit here. So instead of i j, I can write j i. And then I can also change the name of the index variable, whether I call that i or k doesn't matter, so I can call that k. And then I get the k here. And this change didn't change the value, it's just different symbols, but the same numeric value. And that means these two terms, if you now look at them, are the same after I make this fix that all of that I should have been renamed to k. So these terms are the same. So we really have two times this term plus two times x transpose x beta j. Let me copy that over. So d over d beta j beta transpose x transpose x beta equals two times some k different from j x transpose x j k beta k. And then from here, plus two times x transpose x j j times beta j, two times x transpose x j j beta j. And if you look at that, that term here slots nicely into the gap which is left by omitting j in the sum. So that's just equal to the sum where k ranges directly from zero to p without that constraint because there's a gap here, but here's the missing term. So that's equal to two times sum k from zero to p, x transpose x, j, k, beta, k. And that, if you think matrix vector multiplication again, equals two times x transpose x, beta, and then the j's component. Good. So this 
was a bit tricky, I would strongly recommend go through this again in your own time and check that you understand all the details of this. Good, let's just get us the result. d over d beta j of r beta equals, well, first this term is not there, so we can ignore it. Then we get the next term with the minus 2 in front, so minus 2, x transpose y j's component. And then the last term has no 2 here, but if you look at the result, it has a 2 as the result of taking the derivative, so there's also a 2 only for a different reason. So we get plus 2x transpose x beta j's component. Good. And I just write this, I hope it scares nobody. That means if we write the vector of all of these, so that's equations for j from 0 to p, and the vector of all partial derivatives is called the gradient and indicated like this. So the gradient of r is minus 2x transpose y plus 2x transpose x beta. That's just writing all of these p plus 1 equations in vector form together as one vector valued equation. Good. Now we need to set this equal to 0. And we have gradient r beta equals 0 if and only if 2x transpose x beta equals 2x transpose y. But of course, we can cancel the 2s in this equation. So we have that. And these equations here, these are called the normal equations. There is now a next step. Namely, we have just proved at local extrema, maximum or minima or subtle points, beta will satisfy that condition. And one would need to check it's a minimum, but I'm not going to do this here. There are a few hints in the notes, but even there I didn't do it completely because it is a bit tedious and it does not really add anything to it. So I'm just telling you here, it turns out if there's a solution, that's a minimum. And now we just need to find beta. So the thing I did in the notes is I wrote, we assume that that matrix x transpose x is invertible. And if it is, then we can just bring it to the other side. Beta is now x transpose x on the other side. It comes over as the inverse x transpose y. And that thing here is normally denoted by beta hat. That is the value of beta which minimizes the residual sum of squares if that matrix inverse exists. And that is called the least squares estimate for beta. Good. And that was the hard work bit. Once you have done that, then the question is, how can you use this? And I will leave this to the notes to explain because that is much, much lighter. And I think it is easy enough that you can just read this on your own. So, and that has completed our proof. As you have seen, that was a bit technical. But using the matrix notation, the result is quite nice. So we have this one set of equations, the normal equations, which we can write in quite convenient form. And we have one simple condition which tells us when do we have a unique solution. That is the condition that x transpose x is invertible. And now we need to see what can we do with this result. And there is a bit of discussion in the notes which I will leave for you to read. And then you will have me back in the next video where I will show you how can we use what we have just done to compute the solution in R. So see you soon. Bye.